Good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Jim Yeager. I'm the Senior Associate Dean for Academic Affairs for the School of Public Health. And on behalf of the Dean of the school, who is um, uh, traveling internationally right now, I want to welcome you all this afternoon to, um, to this event. Uh, you know, it's very exciting to have you come and to have our uh, distinguished guests here for, for uh, our program on transforming urban communities and building equity and equality. And um, what I'd like to do now is to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Robert Blum. Uh, Dr. Blum is the uh, director of the uh, Johns Hopkins uh, Urban Health Institute, and he will then begin to introduce our uh, speakers for today. Bob? Thank you all. Thanks for coming out on uh, uh, Saturday. It is uh, a pleasure, Reverend. Dr. Jeremiah Wright, to have you here at the Bloomberg School of Public Health. It is also a pleasure for me very personally to have uh, the ability to uh, co-host this with uh, colleagues from uh, BUILD, from Sisters Together in Reaching, from uh, Southern Baptist Church. Uh, this really uh, is a symposium that was uh, determined by, identified by, driven by community residents who said we very much would hope that uh, we might have the opportunity to uh, hear Dr. Wright speak. And so uh, it is uh, a particular, particular pleasure. This is part of uh, Black History Month and uh, part of our University celebration of Black History Month. It is also part of the lead up to uh, the April 23rd conference on the social determinants of health uh, in transforming urban communities. Equity and equality is the central theme of what it is about. Uh, Dr. Wright will obviously speak from a national perspective and our panelists will focus it uh, in Baltimore-related issues. To introduce uh, Dr. Wright uh, is uh, uh, Pastor Dante Hickman. Pastor Hickman was uh, ordained almost a decade ago, grew up here in Baltimore, uh, and actually has some close connections on the panel uh, for those who don't know, I probably in full disclosure should say that one of our panelists uh, is uh, Pastor Hickman's mother, Reverend Hickman. Uh, but she will be introduced uh, uh, separately. Uh, uh, Reverend Hickman has a bachelor's degree from uh, Wiley College in Marshall, Texas. He went on uh, and got uh, a Master's of Divinity from Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary. More recently, uh, completed the requirements for the Doctor of Ministry, uh, Wells, uh, Wesley Theological Seminary uh, near here in DC. So let me uh, turn it to you, Dante, uh, to uh, introduce uh, Reverend Dr. Wright. Thank you, Dr. Blum. Good afternoon. Uh, it is my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce a man who is recognized as an international uh, leader, sage, pastor, and theologian, Dr. Jeremiah Wright, uh, born and raised in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, uh, went on to attend the Virginia Union uh, University, transferred out after three and a half years to go to the United States Marine Corps and then on into the Naval Corps and served as a cardiopulmonary technician. Uh, upon leaving the Navy, uh, Dr. Wright went on to Howard University uh, to graduate with a Bachelor of Arts degree as well as a master's degree and attended the University of Chicago uh, to obtain another master's and furthered his education into a doctorate of ministry degree. He has served as the pastor of the Trinity United Church of Christ uh, since 1972 and has grown that ministry from 87 to over 8,000 members. Uh, Dr. Wright by no means is a shy man of God. 
Uh, he is a man that knows the truth, and the truth that he knows he speaks uh, to power. Uh, he is an icon and an inspiration uh, to pastors in my generation that we should never settle for the couch of ministry being between the four uh, padded walls of the church, but that we should engage in social advocacy in ministry in the public square. Uh, he continues on cutting edge ministry uh, as he has formed the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference. This coming Monday, uh, it will be in its 10th year in which it seeks to retool pastors and scholars to engage in social justice as well as social advocacy. It is my privilege to have known him now for almost 20 years, and he is proof positive that there is life and ministry after retiring as a pope. I introduce and present to you <laughs> Dr. Jeremiah Wright, Pastor Emeritus of the Trinity United Church of Christ. To Dr. Blum, to Pastor Hickman, to Reverend Hickman, Bishop Miles, sisters and brothers. The title of my time with you today, I've named With Liberty and Justice for All. In observance of African American History Month, the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation and the 50th anniversary of the iconic Civil Rights March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. And in light of the wording of Dr. Blum's stated goal in his invitation to me, his words were, our goal in all these conversations, my being here is not only a part of Black History Month, it is also a part of the series of events that we, Johns Hopkins University and the East Baltimore community are coordinating focusing attention on the social determinants of health. And your stated goal is, quote, to identify the underlying factors that need to be addressed and highlight strategies and approaches that lead to equity and equality, end quote. In observance of African American History Month, the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation, which only freed on paper the enslaved Africans who lived in the rebel states that had already seceded, states that did not recognize Lincoln as their president anymore, the proclamation that left all the other enslaved Africans in the other states still in slavery, the proclamation that, as a matter of fact, undid, revoked, and made null and void the second confiscation act passed by the United States Congress that would have freed all the enslaved Africans in all the states, Union states and rebel states, the act that was scheduled to become law on September 23rd, 1862, the day after Lincoln made it null and void on September 22nd, 1862, in observance of African American History Month, the 150th anniversary of the proclamation that re-enslaved the Africans indefinitely who was scheduled to be set free the very next day by the Second Confiscation Act, Steven Spielberg notwithstanding, <laughs> and in observance of the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, which we still don't have 50 years later, the success of a few exceptional blacks notwithstanding, and in keeping with your stated goal to identify the underlying factors that need to be addressed and to highlight strategies and approaches that lead to equity and equality. I have chosen as a title for my presentation the closing phrase of Francis Bellamy's Pledge of Allegiance to the Flag written in 1892, with liberty and justice for all. Choosing Francis Bellamy's words is in and of itself a classic example of a complicated set of ironies and contradictions that almost borders on cognitive dissonance. First irony, Bellamy was a Baptist minister and a Christian socialist. Haters who hear Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. described as both a Baptist minister and a Christian socialist who rush to call or to label King as a communist have no idea 
that the white man who wrote the Pledge of Allegiance was also a Baptist minister and a Christian socialist. But my 46 years of ordained ministry have taught me that most haters don't read, can't read, or have adopted the attitude or mentality which says my mind is made up. Stop trying to confuse me with the facts. <laughs> Second irony and first contradiction, Bellamy's Pledge of Allegiance was first published in the September 8, 1892 issue of a children's magazine, The Youth Companion, as a part of the National Public School celebration of Columbus Day a celebration of the 400th anniversary of Christopher Columbus's arrival in the Americas, the arrival of introduction of an onslaught of slavery, rape, diseases, racism, and genocide of the vast majority of the Native Americans, the original Americans, the real Americans, the Tainos, from eight million Tainos in 1492 to three million Tainos in 1496 to 100,000 Tainos by the time Columbus left in 1500. What a celebration with liberty and justice for all. Third irony, second contradiction. As a socialist, a Christian socialist, Bellamy had originally considered using the words in his pledge, equality and fraternity, but he decided against it because in his own words, he knew that the state superintendents of education on his committee Carter G. Woodson would call them superintendents of miseducation. Bellamy knew that they were against equality for women. Sisters, holla if you hear me. Yeah. And the state superintendents of education in 1892 of Bellamy's national committee were also against equality for African Americans, just like Abraham Lincoln was, the so-called great emancipator with liberty and justice for all. Fourth irony, third contradiction. When Bellamy's pledge was first used in public schools on October 12th, 1892, it was used on the day, Columbus Day, during observances that were planned to coincide with the opening of the world's Columbian Exposition in Chicago, my kind of town, Chicago, Illinois. Ida B. Wells, Ferdinand Barnett, Frederick Douglass, and Irvine Penn wrote a piece whose title was The Reason Why Colored American is not in the world Columbian exposition. Their work masterfully and forcibly denounces the racism of the Columbian exposition while school children all over the nation were chanting with liberty and justice for all. In spite of the ironies and contradictions, however, I have chosen Bellamy's words because I want to focus on the word justice. Or more precisely, I want to focus on the words with justice for all. Dr. Anthony G. Reddy, a black British professor of systematic and constructive theology, combines the fields of black theology and practical theology in, a, in an exciting way for me that makes these words take on new meaning and makes them speak to your stated goals as well as to the two national observances that we reflect upon this year. Dr. Reddy's work with ordinary everyday church folk in the United Kingdom is best illustrated for me by how he teaches non-academic types and quite a few academicians the difference between equity and equality. Reddy starts by having them play a very traditional game of musical chairs. Now, I realize that my youngest grandson is heavily into electronic games, high tech, is his cup of tea, and every birthday and Christmas, he gets some new version of some upgraded 2.0 app expanding his Xbox, iPhone 5, computer, droid, iPad, Galaxy, Best Buy, world of hand-eye coordination, world of fantasy. So my grandson might not know about the OG games they played when I was his age. But I'm going to assume that everybody at the Hopkins Black History Observance remembers how to play the game, musical chairs, quick review, the game, works on the premise of there being one less chair than the number of people taking part in the game. Now get in your minds the games played in the urban centers across the nation from the 1890s to the 21st century. Game, as many of you are painfully aware of, urban renewal or urban removal, Negro removal, community development, LLCs, gentrification, city games, Metropolitan Games. Musical Chairs is a game 
that works on the premise of there being one less chair than the number of people taking part in the game. Individuals are asked to walk around the chairs that are placed in a line, in a row. They walk while music is being played. When the music stops, each participant has to jump onto the closest available chair. One of the usual rules of the game is that individuals cannot go backward to sit in a vacant chair. All the participants can only move in a forward direction around the chairs, which means that if there's a vacant chair behind them, an individual will have to run all the way around the chairs in order to sit in the next available empty seat. At every round of the game, one seat, one of the chairs, is removed. The last person left standing without a chair to sit in when the music stops is eliminated from the game in that round, every round. This simple game works on the premise that there is an element of surprise and that nobody knows, none of the participants know when the music will stop. Nobody knows except the one running the game. <laughs> Which results in individuals running to beat their compatriots to the available vacant seats. The game works on the basis of fairness. Say fairness. Fair. That means in being fair, all of the people in the game are subject to the same rules of the game. That's fair. Now, what the ordinary everyday salt of the earth folk, non-academic types, black folks in Brixton in London, like folks in East Baltimore, poor folks, folks in Liverpool, like poor blacks and brown folks in cities across this nation, what those folk quickly realize after playing the game two or three times, I hope you still have those urban games in your mind, what they soon recognized was this, the game was fair, but the game was not equitable. They saw, right early, as they say in the black church, they saw that it soon became clear who was going to win in that game. The healthy folk were going to win, and the younger folk were going to win. And what Dr. Reddy did on purpose to drive his point home was deliberately choose two trained athletes and put them as ringers in the line of contestants playing the game. The two trained athletes had a hidden advantage. The ultimate duel would be between one of the two of them. The weaker folk did not stand a chance. The rules did not change. The rules of the game made the game fair. But those who did not possess the advantages of the trained athletes were never going to win the game. The game was fair, but the game was not equitable. The critical point of learning Dr. Reddy got ordinary folk to see was this. There is a world of difference between equality and equity, one of the things that troubled me about your stated goals. In terms of equality, the assumption is all people should be treated the same. In terms you and I have heard over and over again, this notion is called a level playing field or a fair race, to use Arne Duncan's pet language and pet project of a race to the top. When using the fair race metaphor, it is the belief that all people should start from the same place and be subject to the same rules governing the activity, and in effect, all the people in the race should be treated the same. What Dr. Betty was saying, what Dr. Betty was showing ordinary people and proving quite pointedly, however, with his musical chairs game, a rigged musical chairs game, was that those notions and metaphors of a level playing field and a fair race lacked any sense of the structural and systemic ways in which fields are not level, nor are races indeed very fair. What happens, he demonstrated, what happens if the governing of the race only appeared to be fair? What happens if some people in the race are given a wealth of unearned advantages which render the notion of fair play in the race nothing more than an illusion? Think for a moment about the awesome speed of Usain Bolt the Jamaican sprinter. In the interest of fairness, Bolt and I <laughs> might well stand together at the starting line of the 100 meter race, the 200 meter race, the 400 meter race, or a mile race. Both of us obeying the rules, down in the starting blocks, playing by the rules, waiting for the starter to fire his pistol. We are conceptually or notionally taking part in a fair race. We are both subject to the same rules. The race, therefore, can be said to be fair, but it cannot be said in any way to be just. It should surprise no one that, that in such a setup called a fair race between Bolt and me, 
Hussein Bolt will always win to explain and to expand the metaphor so that it covers what I asked you to get in your mind a moment ago about the urban games you have seen played in development, redevelopment, small business, startups, strip malls, low income, middle income, mixed income, senior housing projects. What if some of the contestants in that game or in that race, what if some of them have unearned privileges from birth? such as schooling, education, ethnicity, access to health care, access to dental care, the privilege of gender, social networks, and the privilege of skin color in a racist society? What if they have privilege, privileges which cause them to always come out as winners in the race? Can that race be said to be fair? Dr. Reddy's point is, I repeat, equality often works on the naive assumption that fairness means treating all people the same, irrespective of the structural or systemic advantages some groups or some individuals inevitably possess. Back to my field as a historian of religion for just a moment, black theology would argue accurately that fairness and treating all people the same has never been the case, either in the historic practice or contemporary practice of Christendom or in the Euro-American societies when it comes to the social arrangements regarding darker skinned people. In an awesome work I recommend to you titled Another World is Possible, a book edited by a member of our church, Dr. Dwight Hopkins, along with Dr. Marjorie Lewis, a comparative study of the spiritualities and religions, plural, of global darker people from the deletes in India through the blacks in Japan to the aboriginals in Australia. That 2009 study outlined the ways in which predominantly darker skinned people are invariably the ones most negatively impacted by the dominant model of economic laissez-faire neoliberalism. Fairness and treating people the same has never been the case. But notwithstanding the illusory promises of equality, what Dr. King called a promissory note that was never cashed because of non-sufficient funds, Black theology argues that the very concept of equality is a flawed concept. Why? Because black theology is a theology of liberation, and all theologies of liberation start from a different place. Theologies of liberation see the central meaning of the God event within history from the bottom up. They read the scriptures in light of the lived realities and experiences of the poor, the marginalized and the oppressed. And as a result, black theology, the practice religion of the everyday people in East Baltimore, in Bed-Stuy, in South Central LA, the South and West Side of Chicago, in Harlem, in Haiti, in Havana, in the favelas in Bahia, and the townships in Google, Tulanga, Kailicha, Soweto, South Africa. That theology, those religions argue for equity, not equality. And equity is not based on notions of fairness, that's equality. Equity is based on justice, with freedom and justice for all, which is why I chose a language that not even Bellamy fully understood, with liberty, liberation, and justice for all. As Dr. Betty pointed out so powerfully, powerfully in the context of justice, one does not treat all people the same because to do so sanctions the status quo in which some people inevitably win and other people are always condemned to lose. The inequities and iniquities of equality can be seen in the pernicious doctrine that we call free trade, which is of course anything but free. In theory, in wanting to treat all nations as the same, the winners of history, the global north, usually triumph over the poor and impoverished south, having already possessed and created the means for their own economic development which is now denied to newer developing and emerging nations. This economic system may be called many things. It may even be called free, free trade, but it is never just. This system takes no account of the fact that in saying it is treating all people fairly, those who have exploited the world and exploited the resources of others exploited world markets, they possess a critical advantage over those nations that have been subjected to the dominant neo-colonialist exercise of power of the Western nations. It is Usain Bolt and me all over again in a so-called fair race. 
black theology, black theologians, historians of religions, and the religions of darker people in the globe are all committed to the cause of equity. And that is why I believe, as an outsider, that you are having this series of discussions. Equity as a concept starts from the premise that for the sake of justice, there must always be a commitment to systemic change and structural change. To illustrate systemic change and structural change as sine qua non premises for equity, let me give you two examples of what I mean from two different disciplines. One example from the legal world and one from the religious world. Let me also give you two essential bibliographical references which explain in far greater detail what I've only have time to give you a glimpse of. The first bibliographical reference is a book and legal example, book by Judge A. Leon Higginbottom. The book's title is In the Matter of Color. Higginbottom, the Supreme Court Justice for the State of Pennsylvania, demonstrates colony by colony for all 13 colonies of the British Commonwealth, the British Empire, in the North Atlantic, North American Black Atlantic, he demonstrates how all the laws on the books of all 13 colonies from the 1630s to 1787, all the laws, laws pertaining to blacks, all the laws pertaining to Africans, to Negroes, to colors or slaves have absolutely nothing to do with jurisprudence, absolutely nothing to do with legal precedence, absolutely nothing to do with English common law. All the laws on the books of all the colonies pertaining to Africans are based on prejudice, custom, racism, and xenophobia. In 1619, when the ship flying the Dutch flag sailed up the James River into Jamestown, there were no laws on the books of the colony of Virginia about Africans, because there were no Africans in Virginia. By the 1630s, however, problems started arising. Africans were having babies by people who were not African. So laws started appearing in terms of what we gonna call these kids, who they belongs to. <laughs> oh, they're gonna be in slavery from now on. All those kind of laws started appearing on the books. So, Hickenbottom demonstrates, after 150 years of racist laws on the books of the 13 rebellious colonies, one could hardly be surprised at the racism sewn into the very fabric of the Constitution, which was drafted in 1787. The Constitution, structural and systemic, the Constitution of the United States of America has racism in its makeup, the fugitive slave law provision, the eventual proposed reversal of the legalization of slavery in the country by and by, and the definition of African men Sisters, not only racism, but sexism in the Constitution, the constituting documents that make this a country and to the republic for which it stands. African men are defined as property, three-fifths of a man. That's the Constitution. That's the legal framework that undergirds a slaveocracy. That's a systemic and structural reality. Now, are there any Bakers present at Johns Hopkins in this room, anybody here that can bake, knows how to bake, likes to bake, wants to bake, always wanted to be a baker, has tried to bake. Okay, after we dismiss this afternoon, after we dismiss this afternoon, you go home and you take some eggs and some milk and some flour and some butter and some cinnamon, some nutmeg, some baking powder, some vanilla extract, two little drops of lemon sauce, preheat the oven, stick it in there, ding, 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 pull it out right on time, and then realize, I forgot the sugar. <laughs> you cannot sprinkle sugar on the top of that mess <laughs> and call it cake. The constituting elements determine that it will never be a cake. All them amendments y'all got sprinkled on the top of that mess is sugar. All you got to do is scrape it off. We used to have a piece of sugar saying there will be no whiskey sold in this country ever again. Prohibition. We got rid of that one quick. In South Africa, those serious about change, 
realized they could not sprinkle sugar on the top of their mess because the constituting elements, the structure, the system was permanently fixed against people of color, against Osha, against Zulu, against Ndembele, against Sutu, against those called Bantu. So they tossed it out and started all over again, this time including some sugar. Equity for blacks, for whites, for Indians, for gays, for lesbians, for bisexual, for transgenders, for queer, for Christians, for Muslims, for Jews, for Sikhs, for Buddhists, for Shinto, everybody. A commitment to equity and justice means a commitment to systemic and structural change. The South African example offers a perfect segue into the second example I want to give you in the second bibliographical reference. I want to throw out to you the South African pastor, Dr. Alan Buzak, and the white professor of theology at Bethel Theological Seminary in Minneapolis, Dr. Curtis de Young. Buzak and de Young co-authored a book two years ago whose title is Radical Reconciliation, where they're combating Christian quietism and political pietism. And in their book, starting with the reality and the failures of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, they argue for a fierce, commitment to systemic and structural change. They make a case for equity and for restorative justice. And one of the most powerful examples of what that looks like on the ground comes from what all the preachers in the room know from the Christian scriptures as seen through the lenses of liberation theology and black theology found in the story of Zacchaeus in Luke the 19th chapter. He was rich, Usain Bolt, privileged, advantaged, a winner before the race began. Very rich, Luke 19 says. Wealth obtained from taking advantage of the poor. Zacchaeus must have had an office on Wall Street. Zacchaeus was a founder, not of Bank America, but of Bank Judaica, serving in the Jericho branch as the hedge fund manager. A thief covered by the law, upheld by the system, structurally untouchable. And after his encounter with the Christ, after his meeting with Jesus, the justice minister, after his nonviolent experience with Occupy Jericho, Zacchaeus shows us what radical reconciliation looks like. Reconciliation that radical gets to the root of the problem. Not cosmetic changes, but radical change. A radical commitment to equity, a radical commitment to justice, a radical commitment to systemic and structural change. Zacchaeus says, half of what I own Half of what I have, half my stuff, stuff I got taken advantage of other folk, half of it I am giving to the poor. And for all the folk I've cheated, I'm giving them back four times what I took from them. And that's called restorative justice. Where it is not just material goods that are restored, but dignity is restored and personhood is restored as well. Equity as a concept starts from the premise that for the sake of justice with liberty and justice for all, for the sake of restorative justice, there must always be a commitment to systemic change and structural change. The commitment to change grows out of the analyses of social reality, economic reality, and cultural reality and the burning desire to unmask the often hidden and covert ways in which equality seeks to preserve the inbuilt power and advantage of the status quo. Reddy uses his musical chairs to illustration to show ordinary folk how there can be no serious change without people looking closely at the playing field and looking closely at the race they are in in order to see that neither the field nor the race is either level or fair. And he offers what I consider a paradigm shift, which I see you attempting to model by having all the stakeholders at the table as peers to effect meaningful change with input from the privileged and advantaged and input from the truly disadvantaged. Without this serious commitment to change, systemic change and structural change, those who have been the traditional winners in an unequal world will remain untouched by the reality of the losers for whom both the playing field and the fair race will remain an illusory dream. 
Going back to Dr. Betty's fictional metaphor of that race between Usain Bolt and me, in the context of liberty and justice for all, both in terms of black theology and the lens through which we see the world and in terms of what Johns Hopkins and the East Baltimore community and its stakeholders are attempting to do, consider this. What if the fictional Usain Bolts of this world go to the best schools, live in the best houses, have access to the best trainers, and in fact enjoy all of the privileges denied to an alternative group of people. To say that one is judging Bolt and those competitors fairly, equally, is to collude in a wholesale exercise of false consciousness, or in other words, it is a gross deception. The race is as good as rigged. The fact that it looks fair should not disguise the fact that the outcome of the race was determined long before each competitor reached the racetrack. To change the outcome or to be serious about justice means we've got to be biased and unfair. Black theology is biased. Black theology is unfair. And its unfairness arises from the reality that in this world in which racism blights the potential and scars the experiences of most ordinary black people, God does not seek fairness. God seeks justice. In fact, God requires justice. God does not ignore injustice and treat the perpetrator and the victim exactly the same. From the days of a stuttering Moses to the days of a Trayvon Martin, God is invested in getting justice for those who are oppressed. James Cone put it this way back in 1990, 23 years ago. Hannity can't even spell Cone's name yet. He says, in a racist society, God is never colorblind. To say God is colorblind is analogous to saying that God is blind to justice. God is blind to right and wrong. God is blind to good and evil. Certainly, this is not the picture of God revealed in the Old and New Testaments. Yahweh takes sides. <laughs> the so-called unfairness or bias of black theology in addressing the problem in each of these headings, in East Baltimore or East of Eden, the so-called bias of the lenses of the downtrodden and marginalized from the days of Negro removal to the days of gentrified aliens, the unfairness of Jim Cohn's writing and the unfairness of the slave uprising stem from the bold call for equity, not equality. The call is for justice, not fairness. The restorative justice of Luke 19 or the restorative justice of February 2000 13. Thinking outside the box, that's what equity requires. Thinking outside the box about addressing health disparities, listening with care and compassion to the voices of academically trained people like Dr. Maricela Gomez and Dr. Mindy Thompson, fully love. You know cold Dr. Gomez's work, race, class, power, and organizing in East Baltimore, rebuilding abandoned communities in America. Community organizing versus non-community participatory rebuilding processes. Gomez raises the issue of justice when she says, how do we determine equity in benefit? What is the effect of non-participatory and non-transparent rebuilding practice on the health of the people and the health of the community? I was telling Lamont on the way in here, I don't understand how outside of Dante and his mom, I got invited here. Dr. Mindy Fullerlove would have been the one to come. Dr. Fullerlove's book, Root, Root Shock, How Tearing Up City Neighborhoods Hurts America, makes her eminently qualified to be a part of this form and a part of your April 20th forms. She's a psychiatrist, and she says in terms of psychoanalysis that there's a traumatic stress reaction related to the destruction of one's emotional ecosystem between 1949 and 1973, this federal program, spearheaded by business and real estate interests, destroyed 1,600 African-American neighborhoods in cities across the United States. But urban renewal did not just dis disrupt the black community. The anger it caused led to riots that sent whites fleeing for the suburbs, stripping them of their own sense of place 
And she did her book based on three different, very different cities, Hill District in Pittsburgh, Central Ward in Newark, and Roanoke, Virginia. Acknowledging the damage caused by root shock is crucial for coping with this human toll and for implementing equity, justice, and building a road to recovery. How, how do we do justice? How do we implement equity to heal the damages caused by injustice? I have a question. I, raised, I received a notice about your April 20th conference gathering for this group, but as soon as my name was listed as a presenter for today, Jamie Wooten of Kinetics sent me an invitation to attend a symposium on equitable and sustainable redevelopment, a path forward being held on March 9th at Sojourner Douglas College here in Baltimore, <laughs> which will use Gomez's book as a point of departure for strategizing and planning future developments that start with the notion of equity. Since I'm an outsider, here's my outsider question, I'm just saying. Are there two groups and two symposia of participants conversing with each other as advocates for the citizens of East Baltimore? Or are these two groups and two symposia at cross purposes with each other as adversaries about methodology? Who to, is excluded, who is included as the issue of equity become or remains the two-ton gorilla sitting in East Baltimore's living room? <laughs> equity, equity, equity requires thinking outside of the box about addressing health disparity. Equity means listening with care and compassion to the voices of academically trained people like Maricela Gomez and Dr. Mindy Thompson Fullerlove while listening simultaneously with the same compassion to the untrained voices of the urban poor and low income people of color who are directly affected by the proposed 88 acre expansion which is reported displaced more than 800 households of the working poor right here. For me, based on what I have seen in different communities across this country and in South Africa, it will mean creative deconstruction of the business as usual template. And what we mean putting in place new partnerships of persons, institutions, and stakeholders, partnerships about jobs, partnerships for health care partnerships in terms of mental health. Please don't ever forget, you, I know you can at Johns Hopkins and public health, that the only way the Affordable Care Act got passed was to take the poor people off the table. Pharmaceuticals weren't gonna let that get through without taking the poor public option off the, what are we doing? How do we address health care for the citizens of East Baltimore who have no insurance and have no prayer of getting any insurance. Partnerships that wrestle with reproductive health, mass incarceration, addressing the problems of recidivism, education, and to ensure access to quality education or equity in education with liberty, liberation, and justice for all. For me, I'm a retired pastor. I'm not running for office so I can cite my scriptural passages without fear of journalistic backlash about my sensitivity or lack thereof for other traditions. Micah 6, 8 says clearly what liberty and justice for all looks like. God has shown you, O oh mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of us? To do justice, equity, restorative justice. To love mercy, compassionate and sincere concern for the poor and all of God's creation. And to walk humbly with our God, as Dr. Alan Buzak demonstrates. That doesn't mean walking humbly like this, no. It means walking wherever it is God is walking in 2013, walking with the 22 families of Sandy Hook, walking with the 434 2013 death families in Chicago, walking 
with 800 families in East Baltimore walking with the 1,600 neighborhoods across this country, walking with the homeless millions in South Africa 18 years after the Dutch Africanas made a few black millionaires, or walking with the homeless at our doorstep who have given up hope. That is where God is walking, and that is where we are required to walk. I think everybody need to stand up for Dr. Wright. I'm so happy I chose to be here on Saturday. What an honor and a privilege that was. And Reverend Wright, thank you very much um, for that, that, that message. We're we going to continue this day. We're going to give it. I mean, I'm like blown away. Mm. So we, we have an um, exciting uh, afternoon plan for you. Um, in addition to having Reverend Wright, we have some of our local leaders. I think the point that you raised about um, being approached by two different groups as an outsider to work on equity in East Baltimore definitely is something that this group will be happy to have a dialogue about. To that end, we have um, a, a STEAM panel. Uh, of people who are steeped in what's happening in East Baltimore. And we have that panel reflect a, a good cross-section, we think, of experience. And we will give you, the audience, an opportunity to raise questions and comments and chime in on this conversation. So first, I'd like to introduce one of our panelists, uh, Reverend Deborah Hickman. Uh, Reverend Hickman, come on up, please. Many of you know Reverend Hickman, but just a, a quick background, she is the um, community chair, which is the voice of conscience for the community with Johns Hopkins University Urban Health Institute and is the co-chair of the um, Urban Health Institute's Community University Coordinating Council. She's also the founder and executive director of Sisters Together and Reaching, which started off as a team of one, her, and now is a thriving nationally and internationally known and recognized organization providing HIV prevention services and outreach for um, African Americans in the city. Reverend Hickman is a uh, in demand both in Baltimore, um, in the nation, and internationally. So thank you for being here, Reverend Hickman. And if you notice the similarity, uh, Pastor Dante Hickman, who came up earlier, is her son. And she also has raised some phenomenal children that have been major contributors to what's happening in Baltimore. We also have with us today uh, Bishop Douglas Miles. Bishop Miles, will you please come up? And Bishop Miles is another one. He is the uh, Bishop of Koinonia Baptist Church uh, on Bel Air Road. He founded the church on Greenmount Avenue, um, on, on Greenmount Avenue. Uh, Bishop Miles is a, a champion and a spokesperson uh, for change in Baltimore, both within the faith-based community um, as well in the community at large. He's initiated a number of innovative ministries that both guide and support youth, uh, women covering from addiction and the homeless. Some of you will also know him as an uh, award-winning columnist for the Afro-American newspaper. He's an, art, an author. He has published several of his uh, sermons and, and lectures. Um, and he's been in the forefront of a national effort to reduce tobacco products in America. And he serves as a national spokesperson for the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. He's also, this is an important uh, distinction, the clergy member and co-chair of BUILD, which is doing a lot of on the ground floor work here in Baltimore. So Bishop Miles, thanks for being with us today. And then lastly on our panel, we have Dr. Robert Blum. Dr. Blum, if you would come up. <laughs> Dr. Blum is the Gates, uh, William Gates Senior Professor and Chair of the Department of Population, Family, and Reproductive Health. Um, he is the Director of the Urban Health Institute uh, he came to Hopkins to take that position in July of 2007, and 
Many of you know Dr. Blum has done great things. I was a little reluctant to have someone from outside of Baltimore come in and take that role, but I think we can uniformly agree he's gone where no directors before him have ventured to go, and he's been willing to really push the envelope and take some of the risks that have been uncharacteristic, uh, uncharacteristic of some of the leadership at Hopkins. So I wanna say, Dr. Blum, thank you for being the reason for this symposium and being the change maker that we really needed at Hopkins. And he embarrasses easily, easy, but I'll just say he has an extensive academic resume and has received several achievement awards from national societies. He's published several books and more than 250,000 publications on child, adolescent, and family health. So he is a public health expert in his own right. Thank you, Dr. Blum. Okay, so here's how this is gonna work. We are gonna give the panel an opportunity to respond and react and put some thoughts out um, about their, uh, on their own as well as respond to what Reverend Wright said. And then you, the audience, are gonna write your questions down. The session is being audio streamed and recorded. The only things that are being recorded are what's happening on this side of the room. So we ask that you write your questions and your comments down so that they can be read and the panel and Reverend Wright can have an opportunity to respond to you. So with that said, I'd like to turn it over to Reverend Hickman. he did not lose anything in saying what needs to occur and that there is not much that I need to add to it except to say that for our faith community that is here today, I wanna use a very hard and harsh word that if we are going to have justice at this hour, if there is going to be equity and equality in any means of fashion, that we must stop the rape that is occurring in our congregations. And that rape looks like the fact that we are very interested in always building out our buildings. But we must stop today building out our buildings while our people in Baltimore City are suffering. We must stop the rape, and the rape is in the form of always requiring an additional offering before we ask the question as to whether or not you are doing okay. Last I checked the record, it says that we are to take care of the widows and the widows indeed. I don't believe that in our congregations today that we are even concerned about the widows and the widows indeed once they vanish from the congregation on Sunday mornings and Wednesday evenings, that they are left alone at home to die from heart disease, left alone at home to die from aloneness, and so they eat themselves into obesity to the place where arthritis is crippling them. I believe that they are left alone to die with their grandchildren who have been left alone because their parents have died from substance use and substance abuse. And it is time now that we take the offering that is going to help that widow indeed pay her rent and keep her house in good order so that she can maintain a residence that she can live in with her grandchildren that she is trying to take care of. I also will not put the weight totally at the foot of the church, but I will put it at the foot of us community leaders. Community leaders that instead of coming on board and working to be as one, we work apart and against each other. We do not give our young people a voice anymore because when we show up at church on Sundays or for any events, we don't have our young people with us. They are out there in the streets by themselves while we are filling up the churches. We have homes that are fractionated because husbands are tired of wives always being at the church Monday through Saturday and then back again on Sunday mornings. We have so many problems that are taking place that the social determinants of health have not really clearly identified what are the social determinants of health. And I only have a few minutes, so I'm kind of like jumping all over the place. 
But if we are going to be partners, we cannot all of a sudden want money to be spent over here for this meeting and money over here for that meeting because those are monies that are being wasted that need to be invested in places where we can have adequate food in our community, where we can reduce the cost of rent so that people can have decent places to live. We need to make certain that every home has a computer in it so that everybody can stay fully informed and in developing themselves. And I'll stop there because I have much more to say as we get into a greater dialogue. Let me correct one thing before we go further. I'm no longer the clergy co-chair of BUILD. My generation is over. I'm clergy co-chair emeritus. We have two newly elected uh, young adult uh, clergy persons in the city who are leading BUILD now, Glenna Huber, the first African-American uh, clergy uh, co-chair of BUILD, uh, uh, African-American woman co-chair of BUILD, and Andrew Foster Connors, the pastor of the Brown Memorial Baptist Church, I mean uh, Brown Memorial a Presbyterian Church, as a flashback, uh, who, who are now uh, leading the BUILD organization. Let me begin by start, uh, thanking Dr. Wright for uh, causing us to have the discussion that we refuse to have in Baltimore. And, and that's the discussion that begins and ends around race. It's the unspoken conversation that consistently guides every decision, every major decision that's made in this city. I, I was intrigued by his analogy of, of musical chairs because in Baltimore, we consistently play musical chairs. Mm -hmm. And the music consistently stops in Baltimore to the detriment, I mean, to the advantage of a few. Uh, the, the chairs stopped at the Inner Harbor. Uh, most of us were left without a seat. The chairs stopped with the building of two stadia. Again, we had no seat. Uh, the chairs stopped with the building of the convention center. Again, no seat. The convention center hotel, no seat. East Harbor, no seat. And now the whole discussion about Baltimore heading toward bankruptcy, unless we make draconian cuts in services and much needed uh, budget items for the poor, for the children of this city, is again the musical chair stopping and those of us of color having no seat. I was intrigued by his analogy about putting sugar on top of the mess. And sugar on top of the mess is a black mayor, a black president of the city council, a black police commissioner that can be wiped away with one election and right. we're still left with the same mess. Uh, I was con uh, intrigued by his, his talk of uh, restorative justice because again, that's something that needs to happen in a city that's 60 to 70 percent African American, but less than 4 percent of its business community is African American. So we need to be about restorative justice in this city in terms of uh, investment in black-owned businesses, investment in black neighborhoods. Uh, TIFs and pilots need to make their way uptown, just like they always make their way downtown. And, and to that end, uh, the, the church community that I share with on a, on a consistent basis, the build, the build organization, fights these kind of fights. And, and my plea to the, to the church community isn't uh, it, it isn't a, a negative a chastisement at this point. It's an invitation. Come and see what we're doing in the effort of a uh, democratic process and, and, and issues that come up from the bottom rather than down from the top. Come and see the rebuilding of East Oliver. Come and see what was done in Sandtown. Come and see February 25th when we take 3,000 people to Annapolis to rally for $32 million for a bond bill to uh, create $1.8 billion of new school construction. That's restorative justice. Come and see what the church community is doing. <laughs> well, that pretty much sums up everything I wanted to say. <laughs> Dr. Wright, thank you. Uh, you touched both my mind and my heart. Uh, and I say that most sincerely and most genuinely. Let me speak and start with the most trivial and then go to the far more important. Uh, and uh, my colleagues have spoken to the far more important. On the most trivial, uh, there are some things that have been, um, I think, huge steps forward. So you raised the question, 
how do we address the care for those in East Baltimore uh, who are the most disadvantaged? One of the things, a small step, but one of the things that has happened over the past three years is that Johns Hopkins medical institutions have done something that has done nowhere else in the country. And that is that it has said in the seven zip codes that are its historical boundaries, if you live here, whether you are insured, underinsured, or uninsured, whether you are legally here or not, you are ours for health care if you choose. The total cost from beginning to end of care is $20. $20 which will include total care coverage. That has, I don't know exactly how many have enrolled, but I know it is in the thousands, and I know that hundreds and hundreds of surgeries. So Hopkins has said, without an Affordable Care Act, without health care coverage, our community is <coughs> our responsibility. It hasn't always been that way, mm -hmm. and we have a long heritage that certainly does not shine brightly on us. Baltimore was a segregationist and segregated community, and Johns Hopkins Hospital was a segregated uh, hospital. While it avowed one level of health care across the board, it was long after that uh, uh, the wards, the segregated wards broke down. But it wasn't just racial segregation, and Baltimore's history is not just one of racial segregation. It is religious segregation as well. Jews and Gentiles did not live together. They were redlined much like blacks and whites were redlined. Jews were not allowed to go to Hopkins Medical School, except for a very limited quota. So there were, this city has an extraordinary history of divisions to overcome. And it's not just East-West or race, but it is whether you, your grandmother or great-grandmother came up from Mississippi versus South Carolina or North Carolina, or whether you live in this little community or that little community. And I would suggest from a political point of view and a social point of view, it is extremely problematic. I think that while I can speak to things that we have done in partnership with Sojourner Douglas, the point you made is spot on. It is accurate that because we aren't closely tied with one another in a way that we should be, things happen that shouldn't. I would also say that the issue that Bishop Miles has spoken to is absolutely fundamental, and it is absolutely fundamental in the social determinants of health, and we will be addressing that on April 23rd. We will have a panel. It is already being drafted and crafted, and the two people who you spoke about are high on our list, whether we will be successful in their coming <laughs> I know, Mindy. Uh, I hope we will be. So that's at the more basic level. But I think the fundamental thing that you spoke to, that to me was both so important, is that fairness is not equality. That because things look fair does not make them fair. And I could not agree more. We know that people, many people, who live in our community face disadvantage. We also know there are people in our community who live and work here all their lives who have tremendous assets and tremendous skills. I think the challenge is not to slow Hussein Bolt down. The challenge is to build up young people in our community 
through education. One of the extraordinary things that has happened here over the last months, and it has been done by young people, is the stopping of the insanity of building another juvenile prison in this yeah. community. Yeah. And it was stopped not because of political leadership. It was stopped because young people like Devon Love and young people from a beautiful struggle said, no, we will not allow resources to be poured and diverted from what can benefit young people. So we do have glimpses, glimpses of what's possible. And I certainly agree that there is a huge role for the church as Reverend Hickman spoke to, there is an incredible role to support young people. And I think for us, as a powerful, large, wealthy institution, Hopkins needs to be at the table, outspoken on this, and in the forefront with our community partners, not leading, but as collaborators. I think I'll stop at this point as well. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Can I, can I take one more second? You can. Let me just say one thing. Members of our audience, if you have your questions and your comments, just hold your card in the air, and there are people circulating, and we'll bring them down and sort them out and get them um, read in. There let you me go, just Amy. take this opportunity to thank Dr. Blum for daring to risk yeah. by bringing Dr. Wright here. I know my alma mater. That was a risk with me in Chicago in winter. <laughs> okay, great. So while we get the uh, comments card, comment cards brought down, I, I would like to raise a, a comment and a question. Uh, my daughter is here today, Jordan. Where, are, where is she? She's going to be taking pictures today. Where are you? She's probably so mad at me. Right there. And I tell her all the time that you, you can put icing over mud, but it won't make it a cake, right? And that analogy that you gave, I think, is just so important that we try to sprinkle sugar on top of a mess, but you can't get the sweet in something that just was not made sweet. And so the comment that you made, and it really resonated with me about being approached by two different groups for one uh, major push, for work around equity, not even just in Baltimore, but specifically in East Baltimore, really speaks to while we've made a lot of progress, we still are working on our own. And there is a big gap in what our needs are and our willingness to come together to collectively fill those needs. So I would like to put my panel in the hot seat. We have the faith community here. We've got the, 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 you know, the two-ton gorilla of, of Hopkins, which is very resource rich. I, I would say let's stand in the position that we've, we've tried to sprinkle some sugar over issues of equity in East Baltimore. And I want to ask this half of the panel, what is the role of the black church in uh, uh, moving us forward? And then Bob, what is the role of Hopkins and the Urban Health Institute? Where have you fallen short and what can we count on from the faith community and from Hopkins in the future. Well, Deborah, since I am not the pastor at my church, and I might be out of the uh, pulpit based on the statement that I made, but I made it from my heart and from what I know of working 22 years in the community with STAR. And I know it very, very well to listen to the people day in and day out. And I know it from a different perspective of looking at that if we're going to do something today as the faith community and as the community, we must come in solidarity of one voice. We cannot be in the room with a different type of agenda that is really about if I'm going to make the limelight, if I'm going to get something for myself and for my family and for my friends and not for the whole community. And too long right now, I believe that we as a people are suffering from the fact that we are always 
or already have designated who's going to take my place. And who's going to take my place today might keep us in the same place that we are in today, borrowing from the statement that Mr. Chris said, that we are sitting in the midst of where Hopkins is, and so therefore no communities around it should die. But when I ride through East Baltimore, I see much blight. So that means that the community is dying, and the question must be raised. Is it dying because of Johns Hopkins, or is it dying because of us? You might not want to clap and you might not want to hear the truth, but the truth of it is, is that justice comes about when we are not afraid to tell the truth. <laughs> justice comes about when we don't make it one person's fault, but we take responsibility for what we have and what we have not done. So if I want my cake baked right, Dr. Wright can give me a recipe However, I need to study the recipe and I need to ask some questions about the recipe. Because trust me, if you take cold eggs out of the refrigerator and you put it into your batter without it having set at room temperature, you're going to get a different quality of cake. It is not going to come out fluffy. It is not going to be as moist. But if you follow instructions and you observe, what is taking place, you will know exactly what the problem is. And if I'm the problem, I need to correct myself and remove myself. I need to get to the place where I can be a part of the whole so that the whole process will work. For what is upstream and what has come downstream needs to meet in the middle so that we can resolve the issue together. And I think that we are at the precipice of doing something different, something new. We need to leave our old yesterdays behind us, not in the sense of forgetting, but being able to tell the story and know the parts of the story that caused us to be stagnated and not remain in a dynamic influx of moving forward so that we can deal with the problem that ended up downstream because we can no longer afford for any more bodies to flow downstream. So it's each of us to take a look and examine self before we can blame someone else so that we can be an intimate part of moving things forward. I would, I would uh, say that the role of the black church first is to re reclaim its historical uh, perspective. Uh, there was a time in a saying that not everybody in the black community belonged to the black church, but the black church belonged to everybody. Mm -hmm. And we've got to reclaim that sense of ownership of, uh, uh, of the institution, the only institution really that we both own and control. Uh, one of the sad realities is that the black church got caught up in the white church success, the white evangelical ch church success model. And what it ha actually happened was, was the same thing that happened in, with, in music. Uh, white evangelicals sat around and watched black preachers, took the best out of the black church to put it in their churches. Then you had black preachers emulating what the white preachers were doing. And in the process was created this whole health, wealth, and prosperity disaster that has crippled us as a community. Uh, the black church was at one time, and, and, I th and I think it still has an obligation to be a prophetic voice. It has to be that voice that calls both the African American community and the rest of America back to truth, back to the basis of justice, back to the basis of historical perspective that doesn't seek fairness, but seeks justice for especially the poor, the black, and the disinherited in this nation. You want to speak on the black church after me? <laughs> <laughs> Bob, you want to well, expand on the points that... Uh, <laughs> Bob, can I, can I ask you a specific question that will relate to this so the audience gets their question read? It's, going, it's exactly what you're going to speak about. <laughs> uh, it says, with so all the research dollars that Hopkins gets and, and that University of Maryland get, why can't they come together and what role can they play in the health of Baltimore City and East Baltimore? You were going to speak to that, right? Uh, <laughs> Uh, I would be, I have a hard enough time reflecting on Hopkins, let alone the University of Maryland. Uh, uh, so I, I think I'll, I'll focus more on this side of the, um, Charles. The, um, 
So the question was raised, what is the role of Hopkins, at least what do I see? And I think, and, and, and looking forward, I think a few things. One is that we need to be willing to have a conversation about race. We need to be willing to look at our place as an institution and the barriers around that that have been historically created. I am a believer in what George Santayana said, that if you do not learn from history, you're condemned to repeat it. Uh, so I see value there, but I see even greater value to being able to sit with our black brothers and sisters, our growing Latino community, our small American Indian community here to have much more honest communication. That's based on trust, that's based on breaking bread together, that's based on coming back over and over and over again. It doesn't just happen, and it doesn't happen in halls like this, that we can talk about it, and we need to in halls like this. Two is that Hopkins is a very large entity. It is also a very diffuse entity, as is our East Baltimore community. We need to be at the table together. Let me give you but one comment that one of the leaders of this institution said recently after a community meeting. That person turned to me and said, I knew that we needed the community to be part of this. I didn't realize how smart those people are. How smart. Well, that you don't know that. When you sit here and I sit here, I don't know that. I know that when I sit at the same table and that breaks down barriers. And you should say or could say that should never have been. I can't talk about what has been, but I can talk about how to get beyond that. And that is being at the table and saying what are the resources that in fact are at the table that can be shared because not everything can be. Not everything right is up for grabs. So to be clear about that. And again, I think we have the beginnings of some of those kinds of conversations. Hopkins is an educational institution, and what it does and can do much more and much better, I would suggest, is strengthen the capacity building in our community of young people, but far beyond that. We have some programs, for example, for ex-offenders that are training and capacity building programs that lead to jobs. But these are model programs and our community is hurting and we need much more of that. Hopkins is a job manufacturer, but it cannot do that alone. It simply doesn't have that capacity to do it alone. The final thing that I'd say is that we can and should bring innovations into our community, and we should extract the creativity and harness the creativity of people who live in our community for economic gain and benefit of the community and of themselves. There are the beginnings of business incubators that are beginning to develop across the East Baltimore and Baltimore community where people, local residents who have ideas can come together with venture capitalists and nurture the creation of wealth in a neighborhood. I think the likelihood that General Motors is going to swoop in with the next factory to build 5,000 new cars and hire 20,000 new people is unlikely. Wealth will be created at the neighborhood level. There are people at Hopkins who have expertise and there are our neighbors who have ideas. We need to bring it together. 
I'll stop there. Great, okay, I have a comment and a question for Reverend Wright. So the comment is liberty and justice for all. Thank you, uh, Reverend Wright, for your focus on these two words. A just person treats others justly. A free person is unimpeded. Notice that the social location of each is different. The very notion of liberty and justice is a moral proposition of right relationship. Thank you for this reminder that we as a city need to work on right relationships. The question is, you speak a lot about God and Christianity, but not only Christians search for advocacy for restorative justice. How do you work across faiths with people who are not part of any religion to strengthen any movement while still having such a strong rhetoric of Christianity? I think you do it. Um, I, I was just at Lancaster Theological Seminary and I was asked a similar question. I was reminding Lancaster the United Church of Christ that in the United Church of Christ, ordination questions asked during the ordination of all ordinand persons about to be ordained. Do you have the same regard for people of all faith and people of no faith? That people of no faith are people made in the image of God just as you are. And just because you don't believe what they believe and they don't believe what you believe does not mean that they are any less than that they, you are there at the table as peers at the table. Um, building on that, expanding on that, that question, Bob said to me in his letter, he wanted, one of the things he was hoping we'd come away with, one of the takeaways from today are some positive practices and some, some ideas and hints about things that we can do beyond rhetoric. Uh, and I have been wrestling with going back to Deborah, Reverend, Reverend Hickman's opening comment, that problem that she quickly, in a short period of time, summarized for us about a part of the nature of the black church in this country, I was pleasantly surprised, and maybe you, we need to talk, not so much to Johns Hopkins, but clergy need to look at what's going on in some other places. I was pleasantly surprised by something that's working in a place and wrestling with what do you do and how do you do that when you don't have 100% cooperation. I was invited to come to, several years ago, the Concerned Black Clergy's Martin Luther King Day celebration in Dallas, Texas. Well, I thought Dallas, Texas is going to be about 150, 200 people. We're going to sing We Shall Overcome. And, and <laughs> gonna be in the, I walked into Hamilton Park United Methodist Church and there were 4,000 people there. And 4,000 people who were Baptist, National Baptist, Progressive National Baptist, Church of God in Christ, Apostolic Ho Overcoming Holiness, Church Pentecostal Assemblies of the World, Presbyterians, United Methodist women in ministry, with some of those denominations don't believe in women, and they're working together. And I said, oh, you all come together once a year, right? That's, that's what this is. And Freddie said, no, no, no. And he took me to show me the, the middle income housing, the mixed income housing, the senior citizen, the things that they do together as concerned black clergy. And I said, like the people in Matthew 4, we've never seen it on this wise. We don't, we don't work together in Chicago. Clergy, churches don't work together. Presbyterians don't work with Pentecostals because they make too much noise. Pentecostals don't work with Presbyterians because <laughs> they ain't saved. And it depends on who, you, who calls the meeting. Nobody coming because the wrong person calls the meeting. That's how Chicago and many cities are like that. And these persons, clergy persons in Dallas, the concerned black clergy have, have done something phenomenal and are doing something phenomenal with the caveat and a learning lesson from that, uh, for me. The caveat being is that the big names in Dallas don't participate with the, the concerned black clergy. But they don't let that stop them. That they don't have Tony Evans or T.D. Jakes on their role. They go right on putting up housing and go right on doing programs that are changing the communities in which those churches sit so that we start talking about how, what, what can we learn, what takeaways that the, cl that the churches here in Baltimore that are willing to work, those ones that, that want to build cathedrals like Ozymandias, was it Keats wrote Ozymandias, they want to build the memorials to themselves. <laughs> let them build memorials to themselves. Well, that doesn't, don't let that stop you, those who are willing to work together. Um, 
the other piece in terms of people without faith going back to one of my favorite, favorite, favorite uh, illustrations of what one of the things I think we need to learn how to, particularly when you talk about the April 23rd and, and um, March 9th, those two groups, um, learning how to work, well, let me start with, with my favorite. Tony Campola, anybody know Tony Campola? <laughs> Tony got me in trouble with my mother and uh, after he got me in trouble with my mother, the very next week, um, I saw him. We were together on a panel in Philadelphia on HIV AIDS. And I said, man, you got me in trouble with my mother. I'm there quoting you in the quoting you, and get quoting you in that sermon got me. Somebody called, I was at Howard University, 18, 19 years ago, we're quoting Tony Campola. Somebody called Philadelphia and told my mother what I said. And she didn't want to hear nothing about Tony Campolo say that I was quoting Tony Campolo. She just fussed at me. And I said, I get the last laugh. What Tony Campolo, you all familiar with what he did and how I got in trouble with that? Anybody know all, all that speaking Chinese to you? Uh, when Bernard Richardson became, uh, the Sunday he, when he became the dean of the chapel at Howard University School, uh, Howard University, I had been preaching at Howard every December for about 10 years and he asked me to switch my Sunday to the Martin Luther King Sunday because he was being installed and he wanted me to preach his installation. And I went there and challenged him to bring a prof prophetic ministry back to the campus mm -hmm. uh, because it had become priestly. Mm -hmm. And I was there, when I got out of service, the prophetic stoked me, Carmichael, Kwame Toure, and all that, was <laughs> take, students are taking over buildings. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, bring that, how University Gospel Choir was started while I, in that same period. Bring that prophetic ministry back to the church. And scripturally, I used Amos and Amaziah to show the difference between the prophetic ministry and the priestly ministry. The prophet's allegiance is to God. The priest's allegiance is to the government. As soon as Amos preached, Amaziah went to the president and told him, you ought to hear what he's saying over here. So they shut him down. Fast forwarded, I compared the ministries of Martin Luther King, the prophet, and Billy Graham, the priest. Martin Luther not only quoted Amos, he was, his allegiance was to God. Billy's allegiance was to the government. He did not participate in the civil rights movement. He would not march, not even on the march on Washington would he participate with Martin Luther King or with any of the black clergy. He was in the White House for every president because his allegiance was to the government, not to God. And then to illustrate the point, I quoted Tony Campola, and I had his, what he said in my hand, in the pulpit, I just read it. Tony Campola pointed out, speaking to the Southern Baptist C Convention, now every year they send 20,000 delegates to the Southern Baptist Convention. Southern Baptist is 19,500 of them are Southern Baptist Watts, and 500 of others. <laughs> Tony Campola, for those who don't know him, is white, used to teach at Eastern Baptist Seminary, and Tony Campola, was saying to the Southern Baptist Convention that we have become comfortable in our priestly religion. We are no longer prophetic. And to show you what I mean, he ticked off several facts about black life in America. How many African-American males were in prison as opposed to how many African-American males were in college, how many African-American women uh, were in prison, how many were crack addicted, how many babies were born crack addicted, how many people were HIV positive, how many died of AIDS, African, all these facts about African-American life. He said, and we continue to worship in our churches Sunday after Sunday, completely oblivious to these facts. And I'm reading it. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said, and God has got to be sick of this shit. He said, <laughs> he said, with the real tragedy being that there are more Christians in this room who are going to get more upset over that one word than all these facts? <laughs> well, they love that at Howard. They love that at Howard. They love that at Howard. Um, and three weeks later, man, I'm in Philadelphia. I mean, my mom's in Philadelphia. I'm in Chicago. I phone rings. I say, hello. She didn't say, how are you? How are my children? How are the grandchildren? She didn't say that. I said, hello. She said, did you say shit in the sermon at Howard? <laughs> I said, mommy, don't mommy me. You know who this is. Did you say <laughs> shit in a sermon? I said, did they tell you I was quoting Tony? I don't care who you were quoting. Did you say <laughs> shit in a sermon? 
So the very next week, I saw Tony. I said, man, you got me in trouble with my mother. <laughs> he laughed at me. I, I said, but I get the last laugh. He said, how you get the last laugh? I said, because them Southern Baptists ain't going to never have you back again. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you're wrong, Jeremiah. And here's, Deborah, the, the question to, about people of no faith. Here's the question about Sojourner Douglas and Johns Hopkins. Here's, here's the response to the question about mm -hmm. churches in the city of Baltimore and across the nation. Tony said, oh, no, 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 you're wrong. I'm, I'm going back this year. I said, what? He said, they invited me and my wife back this year. And we got two and a half hours to sit up in front of $20,000 guests with nothing but some water in between us and it's a coffee table. And I got 45 minutes to present my position. She got 45 minutes to present her position. And then we got the rest of that two and a half hours to go at each other. Because I believe, he said, that God created homosexuals just as God created heterosexuals. I believe that God loves homosexuals just like he loves heterosexuals. I believe Jesus came for homosexuals just like he came for heterosexuals. I don't believe there should ever be any discrimination at any point. Job, job security, family leave, health care, in terms of where you can work, where you can live if you are same gender. But I don't believe the church ought to bless their union. He said, my wife, on the other hand, she believes God loves homosexuals like he loves heterosexuals. God sent Jesus for homosexuals like he said that there should never be any discrimination. We believe the same thing, except she believes that if two people, same gender loving, are willing to make a monogamous commitment for life, that the church ought to honor that. That's what she believes. I got 45 minutes to make my point. She got 45 minutes to make her point. Then we got an hour to go at each other <laughs> to show Christians how two Christians can disagree. Mm. But ain't nobody getting a divorce. Ah. <laughs> I'm not leaving my wife over this issue. But us Christians, us Christians, especially you start talking about people who don't believe in nothing. Well, you ain't saved. You don't believe in We're not only want Baptists. We, we pull out and start a whole new denomination. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know how to disagree. We don't know how to work together on things we have in common and co community issues that we both have, whether we are Muslim, Christian, Jew, Sunni Muslim, Sunni, Sunni Muslim, Nation of Islam Muslim, or no beliefs, comedic, comedic. We don't know how to do that without demonizing and dehumanizing the people we disagree with. Mm -hmm. And I think we need, that's something we need to start working on now in terms of how we do that. And for the folk who don't like it, we keep on working together. Mm -hmm. They can go somewhere else. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hey, he be be hashando. Well. But I think you don't stop working with people because they don't, you know, they, they're not, they don't share my scriptures. I quoted the Christian scriptures. My Jewish brothers and sisters don't recognize Luke. You know, Jesus was just a renegade rabbi who didn't quite get it right. right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is great. So some of the points that have been made, just so everybody's clear, we think all your questions are important. We just are not going to have the time to get to all of them. I am going to make sure that Dr. Blum gets these cards so you can get a sense of the, the, the kind of topics and and questions and comments that this precipitated, and maybe this is something that we can explore in the Social Determinants of Health Conference or in a future occasion. But I do apologize, we just will not have time to get to all of them. But somebody did raise a question about LGBT um, youth and is there love for them? Is God's love available for them? Because in a, in a world where we talk about fairness and justice, that is a community that is you know, at the heart of a lot of, of inequity. So thank you for speaking on that. I don't know if you'd like to speak on that at all, but I feel like you sort of kind of got into that world. Well, that's one of the reasons that Tutu is, is uh, considered anathema now uh, in that he stands in South Africa and, and pushed to make sure that was a part of their constitution. Mm -hmm. uh, that that uh, Bishop Tutu, um, that, you know, the saved folk think he ain't saved because he did that. Um, my, the best articulation of the importance of that issue and how it is best addressed from my perspective is what I just shared in, in uh, Detroit last night, night before last. How many of you have ever worked, no, not have ever, were at the Hampton Ministers University Ministers Conference when Gardner Taylor was the, was the person who, with whom we spent an evening with the elders, afternoon with the elders, were any of you there? 
Hampton University Ministers Conference started a practice of having an afternoon with the elders where they would have senior states of women or senior states men or both, Henley and Elements or both appeared. And you give them 30 minutes to talk, 30, 40, however long they want to talk at, at their age, if they can do whatever they want. <laughs> and then those of us in attendance have the rest of the two hours time slot to ask questions. And Gardner Taylor had just retired and he, do you know Dr. Dr. Taylor, Gardner Taylor? In Harlem, uh, yeah. Brooklyn, Brooklyn, Concord Baptist Church of Christ. And he talked about retirement, he talked about the succession plan, all that kind of stuff. And then during the question and answer period, uh, questions were asked of him about sermon preparation, questions were asked of him about, you know, somebody of your stature, preaching with notes, preaching without notes, all those kind of questions. And 15, 20 minutes into the question and answer period, this very strident tone, the person came to the center aisle mic and said, Dr. Taylor, the one issue that's tearing the Christian church apart right now is this whole issue of homosexuality. United Methodists have defrocked one of their clergy because they performed the same gender-loving service. The Presbyterians are voting it on this week. The Church of God in Christ has taken a position against it. The AMEs have taken a position against it. What is your position on homosexuality? Now, there are 4,000 ministers sitting in the, in the Coliseum, and it got so quiet you could hear a rat urinate on cotton at 100 yards. <laughs> Dr. Taylor stroked his chin and he said, God, God has this awesome word. Whosoever. The prophet Joel says in those days, not only will women preach, my sons and my daughters, but whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He said, and then Jesus in a midnight seminary class for Nicodemus, a member of the Sanhedrin, he said to Nicodemus that God so loved the world, God sent God's only son, that whosoever believeth in him should not I, 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 I would hate to come behind God and put qualifications <laughs> on who's included in the whosoever. I, um, I, we are de you definitely are getting the last word here today. I think I'm going to make one comment, ask the panel to react to it, and then, Reverend Wright, we are going to give you the last word for today. So this is a, a symposium on equity, and one of our audience members said, and they did to everybody, not everybody, everybody, mm -hmm. but no Hispanics, no Catholics. They're calling into question if we're going to deal with equity in East Baltimore we don't have quite the, uh, the, the populations at risk and in need in East Baltimore represented on the panel. You wanna, you wanna speak to that? I know Bob said, Dad, she put me on the hot seat. Any, any, anybody on the panel? I, I, I think that uh, as, well, the one thing that we, and, and I say this everywhere that I speak now, this is not our grandparents' America. And we have got to move to the point where in every venue that we have, that we make the effort to be as inclusive as possible of all of those who are part of whatever community uh, the, the event is being held. And uh, the, there's a growing uh, Hispanic population within Baltimore. Uh, uh, again, the Catholic Church represents the largest population in the state of Maryland. Uh, but you know, when, the, when there are three faces, somebody has to do the, the inviting. I, I didn't invite. I'm putting it on Dr. Blum. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm going to uphold Dr. Blum as uh, we were in the room together in a discussion about our Gotta Have Faith uh, work that we do together around young people when the issue came up for me is the black church, is she still relevant in the midst of our social determinants and our health disparities? in the 21st century. And the first person that came off of my lips that I felt like could address that was the one and only Dr. Jeremiah Wright. I have heard him speak in the conferences where we talk on HIV and AIDS and also his preaching is prolific and he's always on point. And I think that at this point in time, the invitation went out to all communities and to everyone. Everybody has an opportunity to knock on the door and say, I would like to be a part. But more so than that for me, Debbie, I think at this point, 
it is about the fact that if we want to start taking the band-aids off of the molehill that we have created, that have created the greatest and the deepest disparities in Baltimore City, in East Baltimore, we must deal with the issues around the African American issues that have not been adequately addressed. Anytime you have a community of people who are still living with cardiovascular disease at the same rate that it was 20 years ago, it is not that we are being discriminatory and nor was the door closed to the Hispanic community, but today I believe that we are a group of people as African Americans that do not address our issues except for that we open the door and say everybody else come in, everybody else gets taken care of, everybody else goes home, and we are still sitting in Death Valley. It is time to stop. So for me, I believe that, and I love my Hispanic Latino brothers and sisters, but at this moment, I believe that we all have a responsibility to also come to each other's events, whether we are invited or not invited, whether we have a seat at this table or we make a seat at the table for the next time around. I'm sorry, I'm very no, hard it's a, about It's a something. good issue because I, one of the comments that has been made to me was I had this phrase that I had been acculturated into called people of color. And I had used this term on my radio program, my radio show, and someone said to me, when you're talking about black people, say black people. Stop, you let yourself off the hook, you've gotten real politically correct, and you use this less uh, confrontational term called people of color. But 90% of the time, what you're talking about are people of African heritage or African Americans or black people. Please have the courage to say exactly who it is that you're talking about and not, not take the safe road. Unless you're running for office, why can't you just say black people? And so it's a good point. So I'm glad that, and Deborah and I, by the way, are the co-chairs of the, the Community University Coordinating Council. I'm on the university side. She's on the community side, and I appreciate your being candid uh, about your views on that, Deborah. I think it's time for us to be very candid about quite a few things, and we have not had an opportunity to adequately discuss race, but race is the elephant in the rhinoceros that stays in the room. Yeah. And we, as an African-American people, have always been very pleasant, very cordial to say, oh, it's okay, you come on in, and you get your issues taken care of, but we never get our issues taken care of. It, you know, it's, today is the day that we speak truth to power. And we stop just you know, laying down and letting everybody walk over. And then what we do is we sit back and start tearing each other apart. It is time to stop. If we're going to do things different, then I invite you to come to those meetings that are held, the uh, Community Health Initiative, which is called the Chai or the Chi, whichever one you want <laughs> to call it. It is time for us to all come in the room and be in the room as equal partners. It's time for us to go to the Latino meetings that they have once a month. We need to integrate both, but we need to be respectful of both, understanding that there are language barriers and that there are cultural barriers and that we need to be able to come together and understand them, but not interfere in the process of making certain that either group is getting what they need to get, but that we support one another. Excellent. Thank you, Deborah. Okay, I'm going to give Reverend Wright the last word, but before we do that, again, thank you, Bob and the UHI, uh, for putting this together. Dean Yeager, thank you for coming in and representing the university at the highest levels. I know we have a lot of our faith-based community in the audience. Uh, I, I want to acknowledge my own pastor, P.M. Smith, um, is here. He's a real change maker as well in Baltimore City. Um, all of the young people that are here, the students, there are some faces that I see at all the events, whether they be Hopkins events, community events, church events. So for the people who are out there consistently at the table, on the ground floor, regardless of where your seat is, I just want to acknowledge you because you do matter and your consistent presence is what's going to help us to actually move things forward. So I just want to acknowledge all of you for whatever you set aside to be here today to really have this be a success. And with that said, I'd like to give uh, Reverend Wright the last five minutes to leave us with whatever closing thoughts uh, and messages you'd like to, to leave us with. The, uh, thank you, Reverend. And I um, thank Bishop Miles and Reverend Hickman and Dr. Blum also and, and participants. That last question, um, 
I would go back to Bob's opening salvo in terms of how complicated an issue this is and how things are going on at different places at different times and then tie in with what you've said about someone said to you, I didn't know they were that smart, that there's some conversations that take place and need to take place uh, with Hispanics, <coughs> with Asians, with Catholics. I don't think this forum is that place. Um, that's just my response in terms of um, wh what I see happening, what I see needs to happen, especially in terms of um, what I've seen about a segment of, of and I thought you were going to go there, Reverend Hickman, when you started talking about us, us meaning the black church, um, taking into account, number one, the seriousness of Eugene Robinson's analysis that there are four black Americans, the super rich, who normally don't go to nobody's church, even though the AMEs claim Vernon Jordan, <laughs> <laughs> the wannabe rich, middle class, middle income, whatever they call themselves, the folk who don't realize they're two paydays away from welfare, <laughs> the totally disadvantaged, and the Africans in our midst who are African, been here 30 years, 25 years, from Nigeria, from Sudan, from Ghana, who consider themselves, and when their kids finishing with high scores on ACT and SAT, they want scholarships given to the black kids because they black. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the four Americas that are make up our community and that are parts of our churches. Come back to this third, this third totally disadvantaged one or two middle class like Wheezy, <laughs> who does have a college degree, that one of the problems that we have and conversations need to go on at this level is that a lot of our churches, and one of the things that blows me away every time I see your son, every time I see his church, uh, I don't know why they haven't put him out of every <coughs> minister's conference in the city. He's got these bagging and sagging folk that a lot of us do not want in our churches. A lot of our churches that are building those cathedrals for themselves do not want the totally disadvantaged. We don't want the hip hop folk. We don't, I mean, if they walked up in the yo, what up world, we would have a stroke. <laughs> Cause we don't want them in our churches. That, but we need to talk to them. I've had, for instance, the two populations in the material I've read from Bob and the material I've read um, from Gomez and Mindy and the conversations most of us have never, at, at Johns Hopkins, not, not the school, not you, not the, I mean, university types, ex our kids do, but not us, my generation, OGs. <laughs> <laughs> we will talk about and preach about gangbangers, mm -hmm. but we don't talk to gangbangers. Mm, right. And they need to be in this conversation. We're talking about rebuilding our community. <laughs> you selling drugs out here on the corner, remember? <laughs> Do you know why they're selling drugs? Mm -hmm. I have one, <laughs> one brother, I was talking to Lamont on the way in here today, one, one young brother uh, who's an excellent rapper. I mean, this kid could freestyle. He was supposed to freestyle right before me uh, at a program in Rochester. And the cops were up and down the aisles as, as ushers because all the gangs had come together. We'd had a week-long discussion. And he never showed. He wouldn't come out. And I, I thought he had gone home. When I got back to get my coat, he's sitting back in the principal's office. I said, man, you punked out on me. He said, no, I didn't. I said, yes, you did. You're supposed to, you're supposed to rap. He said, Rev, do you see any bling bling? I don't do bling bling. I ain't got no 24 inch, 26 inch rims. I ain't no big time drug dealer. I sell enough blow with a GED to pay my rent and get food for my kids. When I got enough, that's it to next month. And I sell enough blow next month for the rent, food for the kids. We got this image in our head about drug dealers. And here's a kid saying, I, I do this because I, I, I don't want to work at McDonald's for three, four, five dollars an hour. I need to feed my kids. How many of you have ever talked to a prostitute? That's right. That's right. They need to be a part of this conversation That's right. in this community. Father Flager, a Catholic, <laughs> 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 Father Flager, Saints of Minor. Like you were painting off, painting the, uh, with billboards against tobacco, led the charge against tobacco advertising, our alcohol advertisements in our community. He took the men of his church going up and down the street, shutting down every store that sold tops, paper, any drug paraphernalia. 
but he, he really blew my mind last year in that he, he went out and found, I'm not going to ask the brothers here because I don't want them to get in trouble, how much do the hoes make in, in Baltimore an hour? <laughs> if you answer, you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> the brother said, what's the going rate? Well, around his church, is $100 an hour. So he offered them $200 for two hours of their time to come into the church to talk to them about Jesus and jobs and not their lives. Mm -hmm. And 22 of them got into rehab programs and got into training programs. Yeah, but we don't talk to prostitutes right. in our communities, right. mm -hmm. many of whom watch out for our kids. At Howard University, they watch out for the students. They know the students, and they don't let the pimps and but be by. But we don't talk to them as a part of, we're talking about rebuilding a community. Who's in our community? You got, Lamont was telling me, you got mixed housing. Hey, we got Section 8, we got welfare next to doctors and lawyers. You got prostitutes, you got gangbangers, you got folks selling drugs. Why, you, why do you sell drugs? Because I ain't got no job. Mm -hmm. If you got the training, would you stop this? Mm -hmm. How do we get the training? That's what I was talking about, creative ways of deconstructing the, the, t the template, the business as usual that once, as Michelle Alexander points out, once you get the word felon on your record, <laughs> <laughs> you can forget the job. Mm -hmm. Why don't we talk to people in our churches? Why don't we talk to people in our community? Okay, this person is a felon, but I'm a vouch for them. Mm -hmm. Can you give them a job? Mm -hmm. Creative ways of getting them to change behaviors that are destroying our communities. Um, so I, I think, yes, Hispanics need to be a part of the company because we're talking about what affects us as black people, what affects this nation, we should still won't be honest about race. And the other ethnic minorities need to be in as a part of that conversation, as well as Africans who's, who are taught by the British that they are superior to African-Americans. They need to be a part of the community, including gangbangers, including, including all the people who, who we see as a drag on our community, and yet we're preaching a gospel that says, you included, come, the Lord loves you too. Mm -hmm. I think all of them need to be, but I, again, not at a forum like this. Plus, like, like, like M Mickey wouldn't come out, you know why he wouldn't come out and rap? He said, y'all, did you see who the ushers were? <laughs> right. <laughs> all them cops, they know I sell blow, I ain't going out there <laughs> on the stage. <laughs> that, that, that. We need to have those come, and we need them, in, as, as I found out that week with the gangbangers, some of them aren't gonna talk in no forum like this. They're not coming to no, they'll come to other meetings, they'll come to community things, they'll come to job, you say you got a job program? All right, I need a job. But they're not coming if I know two, 300 people to talk. <laughs> to talk. Uh, so so that's, that's what I mean by not at this forum. I think they're crucial, I think they're a part of the ongoing conversation, and, and I, I encourage, and I want to thank you also for what you were doing and for the things that you, that you articulated just this afternoon, letting us know the things that are under the radar that people, particularly outsiders, are not aware of job manufacturing, job training, uh, health care for $20. Uh, th that doesn't make the news. You know, Kurt Schmoke building a rapid transit system with no electricity under the ground <laughs> To run the system, that makes the news, but <laughs> <laughs> the Baltimore Ravens, that makes the news, but not $20 for health care. Um, and thank you for that, and thank you for your continued work and your determination to make a difference, which involves everyone as peers at the table working together to make this place livable for their children and for their grandchildren. Bob, any final comments from you? Reverend Wright, Bishop Miles, and uh, Reverend Hickman, and Pastor Hickman, and uh, Dr. Deborah Ferholden, thank you all very much. And thank you for uh, coming out this afternoon. I think I see this as one piece of a conversation. If today 
is the end of a conversation. If we go away and don't keep this conversation going, it will be time wasted. But if we do keep it going, individually, in twos and threes, in our churches, in our university, in our colleges, then we stand a chance. Thank you very much.